Uh, the title of this talk is going to be uh, Tim The Timbergen Legacy in Ancestral Health, uh, Why Medicine Needs the Ultimate Level of Analysis. And uh, I'll just talk a little bit about who Nico Timbergen uh, was. He was a, a Dutchman, born uh, 1907, lived until 1988. Can everyone hear me okay? Is this good? Okay. Um, he went to uh, Leiden University, which is, I think, where Dan Party went at some point. Um, that was his alma mater. He became a professor of biology at uh, Oxford University. And he uh, pioneered, he and a handful of other people, really pioneered the uh, field called uh, ethology, uh, which is uh, the sort of a British branch uh, of animal behavior science that really sort of laid the foundation uh, for what we now know of as like animal behavior or behavioral ecology. So, amazingly, he was the joint recipient of the 1973 Nobel Prize in Medicine, along with Carl von Frisch and uh, Conrad Lorenz. Um, he, he pioneered the use of uh, photography and later video in, in field work, which uh, this, he laid the foundations for really the uh, idea that we could like, make nature documentary and, and, and that photography could be used to collect data uh, in, in wild populations of animals. Um, and he, de he developed the concepts of uh, uh, what's been called a, a supernormal stimulus or supernormal stimuli and then physiological traps and as well as uh, this, this four questions approach, which all, all of which I'm going to talk about. I'm going to talk about supernormal stimuli and physiological traps briefly. I mentioned those last year and uh, George Diggs, if you've ever gone to any of George Diggs' um, presentations in the past at AHS, he's, he'll, he's talked about those a lot. And uh, but these are concepts that I think we in the ancestral health community could start using more, maybe employing, and start seeing how these things that were originally, these concepts, these conceptual tools uh, originally developed in animal behavior um, and evolutionary biology could be used to help us get a better grasp and, and describe better what some of the phenomena are that we uh, identify. So. These are a couple of books, uh, either written or co-authored, uh, authored or co-authored by Nico Timbergen, um, or written about him. Those two on the on the right there, Timbergen's Legacy and Nico's Nature, are, are like biographies or academic uh, edited volumes uh, based on his, his work. So, um, before I talk about the four questions analysis, I'll mention briefly again. You know, uh, one of the most interesting uh, concepts that he he developed was uh, the idea of a supernormal stimulus, which happens when the intensity, duration, or frequency of a stimulus is greater than that that would occur in nature, and so thus inducing an, an, the organism uh, to respond in like an abnormal, abnormally intense manner. Right. So the volume, in a sense, of, of a stimulus is greater than it would have ever occurred throughout the species' evolutionary history. So the species never had to evolve sort of a braking mechanism. And so it, it just responds out of, in an out-of-control fashion to the loudness or the intensity of this, this signal. And uh, you know, that can happen in, in the modern world, world often, as you can imagine. I'll talk about that more in a second. But then sometimes, often in association with the supernormal stimuli, you can get what uh, Nico Timbergen called physiological traps, uh, which happen when, when an organism makes a series of uh, maladaptive choices despite the availability of better options uh, based on novel, often supernormal stimuli. Some days, uh, there's a whole literature I've discovered recently uh, that talk about this the same process, but it sometimes may be called ecological or evolutionary or sensory traps. I've seen the term overposition traps for talking about how insects can uh, erroneously overposit their eggs on, onto like solar panels or windows and things. So, you know, but this is the same concept of a trap. Um, this, uh, the, the mechanism, this is not Tim Bergen's work directly, but it's, it's sort of in, in, from his intellectual de descendants. Uh, this came out in a, in a paper a couple years ago by Robertson, Bruce Robinson and uh, Chow Foon. Um, if you know this, you know, the, uh, the, uh, horizontal axis there, the fitness value of resources, resource. Normally, throughout evolutionary history, that would, you know, the preference that an organism would, would uh, evolve to have in response to given some object in the environment would be, you know, positively correlated with its fitness payoff, typical fitness payoff, right? A big chunk of food is going to be way more attractive and it's going to uh, cause the organism to have way more preference than a small chunk of food or a, you know, an immediate sex partner is going to be for a high level of preference as opposed to one, one very distant or not present, right? So that's what normally happens. There's a, you know, preference increases with the value of the, of the resource. Well, 
in uh, modern environments or, or novel environments, you can get a de decoupling from that such that um, if you see the upper left-hand quadrant there, the maladaptive evolutionary trap region, that's where the, the, for whatever reason, the organism responds in a way that the, that the preference is still high, but if you look down on the, the horizontal axis, the fitness value is, is very low. Uh, alternatively, you know, on the bottom right-hand uh, quadrant there, you could have like a, an area in which you have a maladaptive situation where there are undervalued resources. So that, you know, the, uh, you have a low, low preference for something, but if you were to pr prefer that, that entity or that thing, it would in fact carry a lot of adaptive value. And uh, so I, won't, I would like for people in the ancestral health community to start thinking about ways um, that, that, that this might help us understand better what's going on in, in the modern environment. You can imagine a lot of the hyperpalatable foods that people talk about. You know, it's like there's somewhere on that left side, like an evolutionary trap, or those creating evolutionary traps where you have like high preference for Oreo cookies, right? But the fitness value, the nutritional value is very low. Or same way with pornography or, or, or drug use even. It's a way to think about um, evolutionarily novel stimuli like that. And likewise, uh, the bottom right-hand corner there, I'm thinking the, one of the examples I could think of there might be exercise. Exercise has a, a high fitness value, but in the modern world where our lives are so, so comfortable, we're not forced to exercise, we undervalue it. So our, we have very low preference for exercise just, just and intrinsically. And so if we're freed from the necessity to exercise, we, we don't value it as much as, it, as its fitness value is actually worth. Okay? So that's... Uh, that was a basic, uh, some basic concepts, but really this is getting on to the, uh, the main crux, crux of my talk here, the four questions uh, model. Basically, Tim Bergen, uh, based on some ideas from uh, uh, Julian Huxley and, and Conrad Lorenz and people like that, uh, Tim Bergen uh, sort of wrote this paper in 1963 on aims and methods in, of ethology. And this kind of allowed the, the field, both the field of ethology to sort of gel into a, a theoretically more or less complete science. And it also uh, gave us the, the, uh, the four questions model, which I think is very, very useful. The four questions involved, and uh, Michael Rose is here, he pointed out that this, this is actually very similar to, to uh, the, the four causes of, of Aristotle. And so and people have noted that uh, Tim Bergen may have essentially plagiarized a bit from Aristotle. I don't know. That would get us into a different topic. But um, it, is, it is similar. Uh, but in any case, so if you look at the, uh, this diagram here, um, you have on the, on the left-hand side there, like you have two levels of what are called proximate level explanations, like the mechanistic and the developmental. And these proximate questions like, are questions about how, how something works, how the red blood cell works, right? Or how the, 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 the um, auditory system works, right? And then on the right-hand side, you have the ultimate um, questions, the questions of like what are the survival, what's the survival value of, of a biological system? What is it doing for the organism in, at that moment? And then also like the evolutionary history or the phylogenetic history of a trait. This is like why is it that an, an organism has, has red, red blood cells? Like, you know, what's it doing? Like why do they have it, why do they have it at this moment? What are they doing uh, now? Um, or, and, and how does that relate like, to the evolutionary history or the ultimate like Darwinian um, endeavors there. So these are questions about like how versus why. Well, in 2013, uh, Bateson and Leyland wrote a paper uh, sort of after the 50 year anniversary of uh, Tim Bergen's famous paper and it's, uh, it's called the uh, uh, Tim Bergen's Four Questions in Appreciation and an Update. This came out in the, uh, the journal Trends of Evolution and Ecology, 2013. And uh, they, they point out that we, one, one system that we know kind of a pretty fair amount about all four of these levels um, in is, is the uh, example of bird song. Like, why do birds sing? Or how, is it, how and why is it that birds sing? Well, we know the mechanistic levels. Like the mechanism is the level of analysis involving the physiological, anatomical, and neurological sort of mechanistic details involved. You know, we know that birds sing because their throats, their lungs, and their mouth parts their gadgets are working in such and such way, all driven by nerve signals and hormonal status, um, you know, gene expression pathways, et, et cetera, right? You know, so that's, that's what happens at the, at the proximate level. We know uh, sort, of, sort of 
a little bit about the development, like how it occurs in the ontogeny of the individual uh, baby bird that's, that's growing up. This is the level of analysis involving, you know, the activation of genes after zygote formation, you know, during embryological development of, or over the course of an individual's lifespan. Um, for instance, uh, sometimes birds learn, learn how to produce uh, better songs based on hear, hearing other, other conspecifics in their environment seeing. And this, uh, this uh, graph here is um, it, it sort of a, uh, showing, showing the acoustic property, properties of a chaffinch uh, bird song produced uh, normally, like this is the wild chaffinch, this is how the, the, upper, the upper graph there shows you how the what the acoustic properties would look like of a, you know, a normally developed uh, chaffinch bird song. And then the lower one shows the acoustic properties of, the, of a, a chaffinch reared in isolation that did not hear, you know, it's, it's, uh, it's conspecific singing. And so it, it, it developed bird song, but it's, it differs. You could think of that as sort of like an environmental mutation in a way. Like chaffinches uh, evolved to always hear birds sing, but um, so it never had to evolve a way of, say, producing song in the absence of, of bird song because almost every chaffinch that's ever been born throughout evolutionary history uh, could do so in the presence of other, you know, like a learning environment. So that, but, you know, you get weird experimenters that lock them up in, uh, in cages and, you know, they, could, they develop a little bit ab abnormally. So that can be thought of as an environmental mutation, to use a, a term that Lila Cosmides came up, came up with. Um, so getting on to the ultimate, another, uh, the current utility survival value of, this is the level of analysis involving the adaptive function. What is the adaptive function to the organism, you know? Um, like what is this Darwinian function in a way? That, for instance, birds uh, sing because it advertises their location, status, their health, their territoriality, etc. It serves to both to ward off rivals and attract mates. Like that's, that's the current ut utility. Um, and of course, it, it may, this is an area, I'll just mention this briefly, in ancestral health, we might want to always keep in mind, like what was the, just because a trait is manifest nowadays, um, it, it, it may not be serving the same uh, utility in the modern environment that it, that it, it did in the ancestral environment. So there, there, that's how one way that mismatch might manifest itself at that level. Uh, and then finally, uh, like phylogeny, like why does a bird sing? Well, it, it's, you know, it's um, it, it's could sing because it came from a clade of like near, nearby neighboring species that you know it's it's neighboring uh, species and uh and it's like evolutionary family tree are such that they you know it, it they inherited it from their from their ancestors and their ancestors have just passed it along. There's been no selection pressure to to take it out. So that it's not that any of these uh, levels are wrong. In fact, this is this is a lot of confusion when people. And I think uh, all across the biological sciences, not just in, in, in medicine and health, but I've noticed this with, with, even within in my, own, my own department at the university. When I talk, I'm talking to somebody in the cellular and molecular um, biology part of the department, you know, um, we're talking about the, the ultimate, like, like, you know, evolutionary explanations. Uh, the two sides are talking past each other. And this is just even more exasperated when, when those of us try to talk to maybe people who are experts in cell biology or their medical doctors really involved in cutting edge research at, at some, some specific proximate level question, you know, it's like the two sides are talking past each other. It's not that anybody is wrong, really. Um, it's just that really a, no one, very few people realize that a complete biological explanation for any uh, entity, whether they be a red blood cell or a complex bird song or something, right? It really, you need all, all four of these levels, both levels of proximate and both levels of, of ultimate. Okay, so let's, uh, let's step back a second and, and look at a concrete example, okay? Let's look at an example of, of a mismatch effect happening in nature. Um, some of you, how many of you have heard about the, the sea turtle example? A number of hands, probably the, the people that have been that have bombarded with this uh, example. So, Sea turtle hatchlings, you know, evolved to use moonlight as a navigational aid to get off the beach and into the water, right? Uh, the first mission that a sea turtle hatchling has in its life is to get the hell off the uh, beach because bad things can happen to it on the beach. It can die of dehydration. It can get eaten by raccoons or, or, or seabirds, you know. Um, it has flippers. It's not designed to live, live on land. It needs, to, it needs to get off the beach, okay? Well... 
for millions of years, you know, moonlight, uh, moonlight was the only source of, of, of light uh, that would have been present in its environment that uh, could have been used as like a navigational cue, cue to, to help the, uh, the hatchlings get out of the nest. That's their, like, the first challenge of life is, is to find, okay, which way is the, the water? Which way do I go? For millions of years, the, uh, the, the re- moonlight reflecting off the ocean would have been a statistically recur- recurrent feature of the, of the environment, every environment in what's been called the uh, environment of evolutionary adaptiveness. It would have been in a statistically reliable cue that they could, uh, their genes could hone in on, and so they, they evolved um, that as their, as their main navigational cue. Well, you can imagine what happens now with, with artificial environments, right? Humans uh, merely 100 years ago, pretty much, and a lot of coastal environments, especially around Florida, you know, which is where about 90% of all sea turtles uh, in the continental North uh, continental United States hatch. Um, there's a lot, of, a lot of beach beach lights. Well, you know those beach lights uh, emit light from the blue portion of the spectrum, which much like like, like the the moonlight. So the turtles, you know, never evolved uh, ways of filtering out that that environmental noise. Now, right, this, that light light pollution, right. So they oftentimes times wander around on the beach and, and, and die of de- dehydration and exhaustion or exposure or, or predation, right? This is a problem. This is a major conservation problem in biology. Well, again, uh, it, it, turns out that, uh, it turns out that they suspected that it was actually not just the light in general. This, this is what, what the, nature, the sea turtle conservancy did. They suspected that maybe it's not just the, the light in general, but it's uh, this, the light... This, in the, from the blue portion of the spectrum that's most sensitive to the sea turtle, uh, the baby sea turtles. So what the sea turtle uh, conservancy have done, they've done some heroic efforts really at, at changing the spectral properties of the light, uh, the lighting that's, that's coming from beach houses and parking lights. Right there you see on the left hand side, that's what the, uh, the ex- external nocturnal lighting was out, looked like uh, before they, they, they changed the, uh, the, the light bulbs. And there on the right is after, after the lighting changes were put into place. People can still have their, their, their beach houses, but, you know, it's, this is kind of a biohack, right? It's pretty clever. Dan, Dan Party can appreciate this kind of thing, right? He's in the back there. So they were able to drive the, uh, the uh, hatchlings, uh, the number of hatchlings getting caught in this, this, these evolutionary traps uh, down, to, down to zero. I, I, got, I saw this data. Um, you can watch a nice little four-minute video about this if you follow that link to the uh, Sea Turtle Conservancy YouTube channel. They talk about how they, they were able to actually successfully fix this, this problem like through these, these, this biohack, right? So this is, the, this is a sort of a thought experiment, okay? Based on what we've seen thus far in the Tim Bergen four levels, okay, imagine if you were given the task, if you're a conservation biologist, and you were given the, the task of solving this, this uh, problem, this conservation problem, biology problem with the turtles. But except you were limited in that you had, you had all the tools of, of cellular and molecular biology, but none of the tools from ecology, evolution, or, be, or behavior. You've got to really imagine what it's like to not have those tools in, in your like, intellectual toolkit. But you're, you're you know, perhaps a Nobel Prize winning cellular or molecular biologist. So you have, you have just approximate level tools at hand, but none of the ultimate level. What, what would this really, really look like? I mean, I'm, I'm thinking this may be, uh, this may uh, be a bit of a reductio ad absurdum argument, but you, it, it looks like you might get lost in a sort of a confusing morass of cellular and molecular biology, patterns of gene expression, signaling pathways, neurophysiology, variation among individuals in terms of how, how rapidly they desiccate or dry out on, on the beach. You might spend all your time and money developing pharmaceutical treatments for the effects of prolonged uh, periods on the beach. Instead of trying to figure out why the, the, the sea turtles are getting, getting disoriented, you might spend money and time looking at or uh, putting together papers that show this particular drug is effective in this population of sea turtles versus that one. I mean, you, that would be the sort of the thing you could very well do. You might literally spend decades looking, looking for the solution to this problem and never really get to the root cause, which is evolutionary mismatch, right? And it involves having the tools that are available, you know, if, when you know ecology, evolution, and behavior. And that they are essentially the tools of the ultimate why-level questions in Tim Bergen's framework there. 
this is what you would get, you'd get stuck doing. And you would write all your papers about a, a subset of this, of this complex um, morass of, of, of reactions. These metabolic pathways and signaling pathways and gene expressions and tran transcriptom transcriptomics and, and such. I mean, it's not that these things don't, don't exist. They obviously very are, they are very real. They are entities in the universe. These are processes that are really happening. But it just, it's just it, it's making it exceedingly complex, and it's really not you know, the place to perhaps be looking. This sounds kind of radical, and perhaps it is. Because this is, the ancestral health uh, model is trying to get at using all four um, uh, tools that are made possible by, uh, by Tenbergen's framework. They're both the ultimate questions and the approximate level. And that's one of the, one of the things that first got me into the ancestral health scene is I noticed that people were, uh, people were talking about the nitty-gritty details about biochemistry, but then they would also try to tie it back to what was happening, what these, these bits uh, of clockwork in the uh, cell we're, we're trying to ultimately do for the organism in, in the ancestral environment. And that, that's what was very impressive to me. Uh, and so this is, why, this is why I think this is an awesome organization. And really, I want to mention this briefly. We're, we're right across the street from the, from the Salk Institute for Biological Science. I checked their, their webpage the other, the other day, and uh, they, they right there on their front, web, front page, the tout there, the fact that they're using cellular and molecular biology to get at some of the problems that we talk about, Alzheimer's, uh, type 2 diabetes, type 1 diabetes, you know, Parkinson's disease, and, you know, I don't know. They, they have a beautiful uh, location. That's, that's what their, their, their uh, campus looks like right across the street from us, looking out over the, the Pacific Ocean. It's beautiful, you know. I don't know. But I, was, I would say that we... People, we're the pioneers like Terry, uh, Terry Walls and, and Dale Bredesen, what they've done for their, their pathologies. You could make the argument that they've, in, in a few brief years, have been able to rocket past what, what the Salk Institute has been able to do, really, and actually getting cures or uh, effective treatments for reversing a lot of these pathologies. So that is pretty much it. I'm a, I'm, I would like to acknowledge briefly uh, uh, First of all, everybody I know here at this, this conference, you're all, all my good friends, and I've, I've, it's, it's, we all experience the magic when we come here and talking to our, our fellow tribes people. But uh, I want to thank especially Aaron Blaisdell, Tess Fowler, and Michael Rose for direct support and being able to come here. And then also my, uh, my professor, my advisor, David Sloan Wilson, my doctoral advisor at Binghamton, he, he is, is all about Tim Bergen's four, four questions. And he has probably single-handedly introduced these concepts to, to more young, young minds than uh, almost anybody out there now. And I would like, like, like to thank him especially. And also useful conversations uh, I've had over the past year with uh, Ken Ford from the IHMC in Florida. So um, I am about five minutes ahead of time, so that will give us plenty of time for questions if anybody has anything. Please, folks, yeah, do come up and ask some questions. I have a few questions myself, but would, uh, let's save them if you guys have some. So. Yeah, thank you. Wonderful paper. I really appreciate uh, that kind of theoretical underpinning work. Um, I wonder, given the examples that you raised about birdsong, which I find absolutely intriguing as well, um, whether you have any thoughts about sexual selection and whether there's a place for sexual selection as part of the theoretical underpinnings that we can use in the ancestral health movement. Oh, you said sexual selection. Yeah, yeah like uh, evolution by natural versus sexual selection. Yeah. Uh, we'll look at the ultimate level there on the graph. You think, uh, the, you know, the survival value, I think it would, uh, it would sort of be, be, it would be subsumed under, under there. They talk, uh, evolutionists talk about how really survival is not the ultimate goal of evolution, but it's ultimately reproduction. So... Survival is only valuable insofar as it's tributary to reproduction. So really, I would, what do you, would you think that the, that the sexual selection would, would should fall under, the, under that? It would be like a, a special case of survival, right? Survival and, re and reproduction. Yeah, I guess I'm thinking about whether, um, whether there couldn't be sort of an enhanced sense of what we have of ancestral health if we start thinking more about cultural exuberance and the kind of aspects of, of human 
uh, life ways across long time and, and across cultures that really are a product maybe of the, the, the selection, uh, uh, the sexual selection rather than the more adaptive uh, levels. If that makes sense. Yeah, I think I think so. I'd, I'd like to talk to you more about that and get some ideas. Hey, Ben. Hey, Brett. Um, are you aware of any applications of uh, Tim Bergen's ideas or models to uh, sort of like predictive, um, like if you change the uh, ecology in some system, how will the organism adapt? I think, are you saying, like, uh, has anyone ever, ever, like, predicted what the proximate level effects would be based on changes at, at the ultimate level? That's, exactly. Is that, is that what, um, I, I think about that a lot, actually. And I'm, I'm, I'm struggling to find examples. That really should be the, uh, the big challenge for us. Because God knows there's money and time going into uh, big research. Rivers of money are flowing into the biomedical establishment to study the things at the proximate level. I think, really, the challenge for us would be able to say, yeah, we predict these uh, effects will happen uh, at the proximate scale based on tweaking some of these, these ultimate level, um, more abstract forces at, at play. Um, I think people are starting to do that, basically. With like, for instance, like even a simple paleo diet, um, like randomized clinical uh, trial. I mean, I would predict, for instance, and I think people here have probably done some of those studies, like I would predict that inflammatory markers will go down, uh, oftentimes the cholesterol, HDL to a LDL ratio will, will flip, right? These things have, you know, uh, we could predict that that would happen. Is that what you're asking, kind of? Yeah, but to generalize that, um, you know, you, you have lots of data on, like, um, the bird song and everything. Can you, like, predict how the bird song would change based on how the ecosystem changes, for example? Yeah, I'll, I'll have to think about that in, in those terms. Uh, one, re one way I have thought about uh, it, so one person that I've, se I've seen it do it, I've seen do that um, in a medically relevant context is uh, Paul Ewald, one of the co-founders of uh, Darwinian Medicine. He, he talks about how change in the environment in terms of how, how easily a, uh, an evolving pathogen can get transmitted to a new host uh, is going gonna, gonna to change how it, uh, it's how it acts at the, on the individual host, how aggressive or virulent that it, that it is based on changes at the ultimate level. So... I think that that would be, yeah. Uh... Hi, Andre. Hey, Brett. So it struck me when you showed the picture of all the metabolic pathways that somebody had done the work of putting it all in one place. I wonder if you know if anyone, yeah, that one, um, has done something like enumerated, made an attempt at enumerating all of the evolutionary mismatches currently we are experiencing in modern life. And then... You could almost see creating a checklist and saying, okay, well, I'm definitely mismatched here. I'm letting artificial light hit my eyeballs at midnight or something like that. I'm not eating right. I'm not paying attention to my circadian rhythms. Some, some grading mechanism, maybe Dan Pardee's tried to do something, or maybe there's some practitioners who try to give people a, a heuristic, but it could, it could be valuable. Yeah, wouldn't that, wouldn't that be great, though, for real? If, if we could have, like, like, like the arrows going through this, like, you know, saying, okay, here's what's changing at this level, and this, at this stage, at this stage, at this step, exactly what's happening, you know, at each one. And it, that's what would be, that, that's where I see the future of ancestral health is the merging of, like, like people really doing, uh, living up to uh, Tim Bergen's dream of having complete four-question um, answers to, to all these phenomena. You know, that, right, but and then and then for personally, we all could look at this checklist, and probably we would learn some areas that were out of whack and didn't even know that that was happening, kind of thing. Oh yeah, yeah. I mean, I mean, none of us are experts. Are very few, very few people can master all four things. I mean, you can spend a whole lifetime. People do spend whole lifetimes just looking at, at one small subset of, say, development or or cellular and molecular biology. Just you know, it's easy to get. Uh, it's hard hard to see all all four. Okay. You know, it's the, it's the same same time. Thank but wait, I'll say this briefly. One one advantage of the uh, of the of having that Tim Bergen, the ultimate evolutionary uh, perspective, is it would allow you to pick out which particular proximate level mechanisms are. Like the the, the sea turtle conservancy, and the conservation biologists there were able to say, let's not look. We don't we don't have to we don't have to look at every step in this this process. We we can predict. Ah, I bet it's the damn blue, not just the light, nocturnal lighting 
coming from the beach houses, but it's perhaps just the blue portion of the spectrum. So we can just uh, filter out that blue uh, light pollution in their environment and, and, and have the effect. We can biohack that part. So that's the advantage, really, is it, it's not, it helps us find our way out of the, the, the wilderness of, of all these proximate level, level cellular and molecular biology questions, hopefully. Yeah. It points, it points the direction. It gives us like a, like a compass. Yeah. Hi, Todd. Great talk. And my point, my question really follows on on what you just said about um, using the two levels to work together. In fact, I think some of the best talks and papers uh, in, use an interaction, you know, between those two levels. And we've even, even seen here in this conference for example, I think Ron Rosedale's talk on mTOR was looking at it both at a mechanistic proximate level and an evolutionary level. And I think Amber's talk on uric acid was, it was the same thing. This very, very specific metabolic product, she was looking at it in terms of uh, impact and in, in how uh, migratory birds you know, might evolve. So I think the best talks actually incorporate both and the, the proximate feeds to the ultimate and the ultimate feeds to the proximate. Oh, yeah, yeah. I, mean, I hope one day that I'm, I'm as good as they are, and I know as much about the proximate level stuff as I do. I mean, I'm, I'm, I, I tend to do better. I understand uh, arguments from evolutionary theory more. I'm more curious about that. But um, I, you know, I know enough of the proximate level to, to know that the people who can combine those two, the ultimate and proximate, are, are, are really doing, doing the Lord's work there. So, hi, Kevin. Thanks, Brett. That was amazing. Um, could you put that slide back up of proximate and ultimate? That was so, yeah. Um, in my field, and Mike Mew and uh, Scott Solomon's the dentists that are here, uh, and um, physicians, how many physicians are here? Or a couple, good. One of the problems that we have, uh, and I think I really see... Um, a solution, a help coming from you, um, in that Randy Nessie, who is the uh, physician who, who developed the whole concept of, uh, with George C. Williams, an evolutionary biologist of evolutionary medicine, the first conference that, that he was um, speaking at to a medical group um, was, uh, he got up there and, and introduced the whole theory. And then as he's leaving the podium, he's passing Stephen Jay Gould, who was invited as an evolutionary biologist to, to talk. And Gould said, nice talk, Randy, uh, but they didn't understand a goddamn word of it. And it's, it's really true. Everybody here, well, it's going to, I'm so looking forward to talking to people this afternoon because you guys get it. I don't have to spend the first part of my lecture, and that's what Nessie learned. He has to spend almost half a lecture laying down the basics for medical students and, and physicians and dentists. Are you ever um, asked to speak at medical conferences or dental conferences? Because what you have there, you know, what is the, the proximate cause of a disease? You know, bacteria entering, you know, fever entering the blood. But what's that fever mechanism ultimate? You will be so valuable to medicine and dentistry, Brett. And I'm, I'm just wondering, are, is that something that interests you at all? Or have you been asked yet to, to do this? No, I'm fl I'm flattered. Uh, I'm flattered you would say that. I mean, hopefully, uh, if and when I make better progress on my uh, getting my PhD, you know, uh, toward the the completion stages, uh, hopefully that will start to happen. You mentioned? Did you mention fever? Fever. fever yeah, fever. Look at. Look, I would like to just mention that. Like, like look at that. Uh, me, fever would be something that you know would be studied maybe at the proximate scale. They uh, know that oh, well, this is this gene turns on and it creates this you know uh, signaling pathway that then upregulate some, some gadget in the body, and then, oh, let's just give, for, for centuries now, uh, people, doctors um, have just said, okay, well, my patient's suffering, he or she is, like, feels bad, they, they're running a fever, let's do something to reduce that, that fever. Well, they never, literally never ask, uh, well, maybe there's a survival value. Yeah. Maybe the fever is there to do something. Yes, it makes the patient uh, hurt, but there are some, there are some things more important in life than to be free of pain at every given second, like, like getting over an infectious pathogen. And if it's, uh, and if it, 
that pain and fever is going to make you chill out and lay down and curl up and, and, and burn the, uh, the uh, pathogen out, which is what apparently there's a function, there's an ultimate survival value um, to, to the fever. The fever is an adaptation. It's an evolved response to the pathogen. But that, even that concept is not, is not well, well known uh, even among uh, many medical doctors. And, and yeah, Randy, fever, and fevers make us miserable, but it makes life impossible for the pathogen. Yeah. So, so that's you, the... So you know, you know, Randy, Randy Nessie has talked a lot about medical. I mean, he's just trying to get some of these basic ideas introduced in, in, into medical school because it's not, because they, they have to study so much detail in cellular and molecular biology. It's hard to, for them to even see the value of, uh, of the evolution approach, right? So we're trying to, I think, they, they think the Tim Bergen framework is saying it's not an either or. It's like this, is, this will allow you to understand better what's going on at the approximate levels and why those approximate level things are happening in the first place. What's up, Dan? What's up, Brett? Uh, I want to say congratulations on doing an uh, excellent talk today and to say that uh, it's been fun to watch your journey and you serve as a really excellent champion to the ideals that holds all of this together. And wow. <laughs> Thank you. That's, that's, that's very, very flattering coming, coming from you there, yeah. my friend. Well, so. Thank you. Um, and to, to your point, I just wanted to make a, a, a couple of comments. But uh, I think one thing that we see when we don't have a more complete perspective of all the factors that are affecting our health is that we will over-index on one of them, like exercise. So if you don't achieve all of the health that you'd like, well, then I better just exercise more, which could lead to a different type of mismatch. Right, so having a checkbox is an excellent idea, and undoubtedly we will discover more ways in which uh, we are increasingly accelerating our mismatch in time. 15, 20 years ago, we didn't know much about how light affects circadian rhythms and all the ways that affects the body and same with the microbiome. And so now those are being included as a part of health models, and what will we know in 10 or 15 years from now? But I think the more that we can try to establish a more uh, evolution, evolutionarily natural pattern across every way that we can conceive, we're going to get better f results than trying to squeeze blood out of an orange through one of those tools, if you will. So good, good point on that. I wanted to sort of reiterate it and agree. And um, I did have another point, but I'm forgetting, so I'll have to say it with, <laughs> say it, share it with you afterwards. Hey, can I ask you a quick, quick question? You, sure. you, you just completed your PhD uh, in a pretty hardcore uh, science. Have, has, uh, do you think for you, um, understanding, having at least one eye toward the ultimate uh, level, yeah. the evolutionary kind of framework, has it helped you be able to sort through some of the, the tedium that you see in, in a lot of scientific studies? And um, has it, would you say it, it's been useful in helping you kind of develop a framework to make sense of it all a little bit better? Yeah, outside of it, outside of my specific field, because it's harder for sleep. I mean, more so with circadian biology, for sure. Circadian biology. Um, but the way that I, this was the other comment that I was going to make, that um, health, of course, is very confusing, and rightfully so, but it seems incredibly confusing, where the more you learn, if those are all individual pieces that are not tied together in any way, then it feels like every time you learn something else of value, it's like, gosh, that's one more thing that I'm going to forget. But if all of those points feed up to a North Star, which is to live more naturally, then every time you learn something new, it reinforces the idea versus just add complexity to this thing that overwhel overall feels overwhelming. So I think having that perspective, I've always liked the idea of mashing up sort of modern day science, the proximate and the ultimate, but I couldn't ag agree more. You could absolutely get lost in the proximate. And you know, I think we're gonna develop AI systems and stuff to sort of establish uh, truths to get more evidence for it, and I think we should. But uh, the having that ultimate view is can really uh, make your efficient your your research efforts more efficient. Yeah, I hope so. I think really? so. Yeah. yeah, it should be a part of every research project. Just look back in history and say, what's that? That what that should be a part of every paper. It should be part of every paper. Right on. Yeah. Thanks, Brett. We have, we're just about at 41 minutes, so. Yeah, I was gonna add, I completely agree. So I just fairly recently, I graduated from medical school and uh, feel lucky to be in this community where you can have a different lens and to blend uh, the ultimate and proximate causes. And I think 
we get so bogged down in the approximate level that there's like no space for even thinking about things evolutionarily. And you could eliminate some of these proximate lectures that we would have and just insert one little lecture with some ultimate explanation, you know, read their book and you start to look at things differently and you, you can have a completely different lens. And I think that would be a wonderful area to, to start to partner up and having individuals like yourself and, you know, us in the medical profession to try to get into these schools and just get one lecture to give people a, a completely different conceptual framework yeah. to look at systems. And so I definitely, I completely agree. And we got to, you know, figure out maybe that something we champion in this society is getting into those areas because I think it could do a lot of good uh, when you get to folks at that level and start thinking about things differently. And as you were saying too, it's not about our way versus their way. It's about really blending it and seeing how you can look at things. Uh, yeah, it's about having a complete framework to explain correct. something. Yeah. Yeah. Hi, Stephanie. I just wanted to say that um, at what thank you, awesome, everything. And to this last train of thought that everybody's asking, um, Josh Turknet's talk uh, a little later on is is how to win at Angry Birds. And I think he also like he's dividing it into like uh, source level and game level stuff that, mm -hmm. and has a nice diagram of a bunch of things that could go on a checklist like this. So I would recommend like for everybody that wants to keep following on that same track, I think his talk would be a really of interest. Um, along the same thought process that's later this afternoon. Yeah, how to, how to win at Angry Birds. How to, how to win at Angry Birds. Okay, yeah. It's, a, it's, it's funny and fun and it's great. And, and it covers this like looking at, he, he calls, I think what would be proximate here, he calls source level and ultimate he calls game level and like how to look at these things in a way that's really understandable because it's like about Angry Birds. <laughs> yeah, yeah. We're talking about sort of a concrete versus abstract dis distinction too. So it's, I'm still thinking about all that. Uh, I guess we're out of time. Uh, thank you all for coming and being here. Uh